Hi everyone. Today in this video we are going to discuss about side effects of ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors are the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors which are well known by their suffix PRIL. Here PRIL indicates these drugs are proline residues. So this is the proline structure. This structure is incorporated in the AC inhibitors which is modified in several ways to produce various types of AC inhibitors. So all these drugs are ending with the suffix PRIL. For instance, captopril, lisinopril, these two are the active drugs. But other AC inhibitors are the prodrugs. They need bioactivation and once they are converted into active metabolite only, they can inhibit the enzyme activity. So these drugs include enlapril, ramipril, fosinopril, trandolopril are few of the examples for prodrugs. Still we have so many types of drugs which are classified as AC inhibitors. Whether it is an active drug or prodrug, all these AC inhibitors are having the same suffix pril. So today in this video we are going to discuss what are the possible side effects produced by these AC inhibitors. Now the prills can affect the different organs. Initially they can affect the renal system since they are acting on the renin angiotensin system. Similarly, they can affect cardiovascular system as well as they can affect the potassium levels and they can also affect the hepatic system, even respiratory system. So now let us go with the discussion of one by one. What are the possible side effects produced by AC inhibitors? First one is the renal impairment. Since AC inhibitors are acting on renin angiotensin system, they can affect the glomerular filtration. So at the Bowman's capsule, the incoming arterioles are called as efferent arterioles and the outgoing arterioles after the filtration are called as efferent arterioles. Now the rate of glomerular filtration is affected by two types of mediators. First one is the prostaglandin I2 which is also called as prostacycline and second one is the angiotensin 2. These two mediators can affect the filtration of small molecules as well as proteins within the glomerulus. Now the prostaglandin I2 can act on the IP receptors on the efferent arterioles, thereby it can produce vasodilatation. On the other hand, angiotensin 2 act quite oppositely. It acts on the efferent arterioles so that it can produce vasoconstriction. In this way, PGI2 produce vasodilatation and angiotensin 2 produce vasoconstriction. But both of these effects are additive in nature since it is going to increase the rate of filtration within the glomerulus. Now because of vasodilation of efferent arterioles, the molecules can easily enter into the glomerulus and due to the vasoconstriction of efferent arterioles, a filtration pressure is going to be applied so that the small molecules are going to be filtered whereas large particles such as proteins are not filtered and they are passing through the efferent arterioles. So vasoconstriction of efferent arterioles mainly produce the filtration pressure which increase the rate of filtration. Now AC inhibitors can inhibit the synthesis of angiotensin 2 so that they can prevent the vasoconstriction mediated by angiotensin 2 leading to loss of vasoconstriction and decrease in the filtration pressure. Now when these efferent arterioles are not constricted, the filtration pressure is reduced so that many of the molecules are not filtered, instead they are passed into the efferent arterioles. In this way, AC inhibitors can reduce the rate of glomerular filtration rate which results in renal impairment. Now AC inhibitors can produce a renal impairment due to the decreased rate of glomerular filtration. This is more important in the patients with bilateral renal artery stenosis. So in this condition both efferent as well as efferent arterioles are constricted resulting in the decreased filtration pressure. In those patients AC inhibitors can produce further renal impairment because of decreased rate of filtration. Similarly, the patient with severe congestive heart failure as well as post myocardial infarction. In such patients, again circulation collapse can be observed which results in the decreased renal perfusion pressure leading to renal impairment when they are given with AC inhibitors. So this is one of the important precautions that should be considered when these drugs are prescribed for chronic periods. Second one is the hypotension. Normally when there is decreased perfusion pressure, the renin angiotensin system is going to be activated and here one of the mediator is the angiotensin 1 
which is going to be converted into angiotensin 2 by the enzyme ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. Now this angiotensin 2 can act on the vascular smooth muscle which is expressed with angiotensin 2 receptors subtype 1 which is indicated by AT1. Now when this angiotensin 2 acts on AT1 receptors, it can produce vasoconstriction. This vasoconstriction results in the increase in the perfusion pressure. This is the normal physiological mechanism where the perfusion pressure is going to be restored by renin angiotensin system. But when the patient is administered with AC inhibitors, they can block the activity of AC enzyme resulting in the decreases of angiotensin 2 and in the absence of angiotensin 2, the blood vessels are going to be dilated resulting in the hypotension in the patients. So AC inhibitors can produce hypotension and sometimes they can also produce orthostatic hypotension, the decrease in the blood pressure with change in the position of the patient. And this hypotension is more pronounced in the patients with oligouria, in the patients with decreased urine output or in the patients with heart failure where the systolic blood pressure is less than 100 millimeter of mercury. In such patients, hypotension is more pronounced when they are prescribed with AC inhibitors. Similarly, diuretics can produce volume depletion. Again, in such patients, this hypotension is more pronounced along with AC inhibitors. Third one is the hyperkalemia. Normally, the potassium within the serum is going to be excreted through the renal system. Under the normal functionality of renal system, potassium can be easily excreted. But in presence of AC inhibitors, they can inhibit the renal functionality so that the potassium cannot be excreted easily. So potassium levels are accumulated within the blood resulting in the hyperkalemia. This raised levels of potassium within the serum leading to hyperkalemia may result in various symptoms in the patients. It can produce some palpitations, cardiac arrhythmias and some muscle weakness, fatigue, all this can be observed because of raised levels of potassium. And when these AC inhibitors are given along with any potassium supplements, otherwise they are given with potassium sparing diuretics such as amyloride, triamterene, spironolactone. These drugs can increase the potassium levels by reducing their excretion resulting in further hyperkalemia. So care should be taken in the patients who are prescribed with AC inhibitors the potassium levels should be closely monitored and any use of potassium supplements and potassium sparing diuretics should be avoided in order to minimize the risk of hyperkalemia. Fourth one is the hepatic failure. AC inhibitors can affect the hepatic system and they can produce some hepatic failure in the patients with any risk factors. And when these drugs are prescribed for longer periods, they can increase the bilirubin levels resulting in jaundice or they can also produce some hepatitis in the patients. The liver enzymes are going to be elevated and blood urea nitrogen is also elevated. So hepatic function should be checked in the patients with any risk of hepatic dysfunction. Fifth one is a dry cough. This is a common side effect observed with AC inhibitors because of their additional action. Normally bradykinin is one of the peptide which is going to be activated by metabolism. So this bradykinin can be converted into Desarginine bradykinin, which is the active metabolite of bradykinin, resulting in the vasodilatation. At the same time, bradykinin can be converted into an inactive metabolite. Both of these metabolic reactions are mediated by kinase enzymes. The first one is mediated by kinase 1 and the second reaction is mediated by kinase 2. Now, this kinase 2 is having some structural similarity with the AC enzyme. Because of this, now AC inhibitors can block this kinase 2 enzyme so that the bradykinin is not metabolized into inactive metabolite. So this results in the accumulation of bradykinin levels which affects the respiratory system resulting in the dry cough in the patients. Sixth one is the angioedema. This is a hypersensitive reaction produced by AC inhibitors. These drugs can produce some anaphylaxis resulting in the swelling of lips, tongue, glottis, larynx even face. So these anaphylactoid reactions can be observed with AC inhibitors because of any hypersensitivity. And they can also produce some intestinal angioedema resulting in some abdominal pain as well as nausea and vomiting. So even these side effects are rarely observed 
but caution should be taken to check any development of angioedema within the patients. Now let us see other side effects produced by AC inhibitors. They can also affect the central nervous system resulting in some dizziness, headache and they can also produce some fatigue. And these drugs are teratogenic in nature and they can produce some fatal damage. So these are the common side effects of AC inhibitors. But among these drugs, captopril is a designer drug which is having a thial group within the structure. Because of this thial group, now this drug can produce few of the side effects such as taste disturbances and proteinuria, the protein within the urea. These are because of thial group within the structure of captopril which produce some taste disturbances and proteinuria within the patients. So these are the important and common side effects of AC inhibitors. So that's for today. We will come with another interesting topic in our next video. Thank you for watching this video.